All right, all right. Welcome back, everyone. Up next, we have Omar talking about building a web application, building web application labs with WebSploit. Uh, again, thank you to Quadrant Security and CrowdStrike for sponsoring us. And without further ado, Omar, take it away. Awesome. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here, and thank you, everybody, for attending the, the conference. Uh, actually, I have participated in a couple of other uh, sessions in here uh, on and off, and you know, kudos to the organizers. Thank you so much for putting this together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen real quick, of course. And basically, my talk today is building labs that can be extensible or it can be very, very simple. So I'm gonna start with a very simple ways that you can actually build a cybersecurity lab, mostly for penetration testing or ethical hacking. And then we're gonna go shift gears into, you know, spice things up depending on the conversations and depending on the questions that we have. And by the way, at any time, feel free to ask any questions. And, um, and you know, I'm gonna give you a lot of what I call homework, basically a lot of resources that you're gonna have after the class, completely free, of course of lab guides and, um, you know, exercises and GitHub repository, sample code, and, you know, many other things. So with that said, let's actually get started. Uh, first thing, you know, a little bit about myself. A uh, long time ago and a lot of pounds ago, I was in the Marine Corps. I was um, 2841, uh, so a ground um, communications, basically technician. And then from there, I specialized in, in a SIG Intel, and then I shift gears into 2600, right? So it was a 2611. Now, um, after that, I joined Cisco. So I've been at Cisco for 20 years now. So quite a, quite a bit of a ride. And I started basically in the technical assistance center supporting a crypto gear and also, you know, things like firewalls or IPS. And then I shifted into supporting very large customers, doing different architecture reviews, doing a pen testing. That's where I got started with pen testing. And then uh, I was traveling pretty much 100% of the time. I did that for a few years. And then I shifted gears into an incident response team that what we do is we do vulnerability research and disclosures of vulnerabilities in Cisco products and also in industry-wide problems. So if there's a protocol vulnerability that may affect, I don't know, WPA or BGP or you know, any of the protocols that you know, multiple vendors will actually use, I get engaged into that. And I also lead a few things in the industry. I'm a co-lead to the Red Team Village and, you know, written some books and everything. But two things that I want to highlight in this screen is basically how to follow up with me, right? You can follow, you know, follow up with me in either LinkedIn or Twitter. My user ID for LinkedIn is the same, Santos Omar. And the... Um, I lead the Red Team Village at DEF CON. So, you know, we have a Discord ch channel or Discord server in there that we have about 9,000 people. So with that said, um, let me actually do this. because I'm gonna be going mostly in this monitor. So I'm gonna disable my video real quick. Bear with me, just one second. So you get the full um, agenda here. So we're gonna start with a very, very intense introduction to hacking web applications. As a matter of fact, I will probably say that this is too much of an intense introduction. It's very, very high level. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a lot of resources on how to get started. And even though I have the word web applications, basically I'm going to give you resources as well to look into Kubernetes, you know, uh, modern ways that applications are being deployed both on premise and in the cloud, orchestrated and so on, and, and how to pay attention and security in those environments as well. But we're going to go over, you know, how to build simple labs. And I created you know, an environment that I use for many of my either books or video courses, or, you know, I teach in O'Reilly and peers on education and so on. And um, it's basically based on Kali Linux and with a whole bunch of containers and some tools and a GitHub repository that I created for all those classes. So I'm going to give you access to that. Of course, it's completely free. We're going to go into the introduction, a lot of demos. So as a matter of fact, all the containers include intention of vulnerable applications that you have over 450 exercises that you can take advantage of. And then we're gonna conclude with demo and a QA, and a right? And whenever I said demos at the end, basically I'm probably gonna be doing demos, you know, here and there. So don't, 
don't feel that you know the boring slides are going to be the majority of the course, which is actually not going to be the case. All right, so I have this presentation and also a lab guide that I consider, um, you know, I, I call it homework, basically, that you can do, you know, of course, um, you know, after the presentation today, that lab guide probably will take you anywhere between two to three hours to complete. And the exercises in the environment that I'm going to introduce called Websploit is probably going to take, you know, anywhere between, I don't know, a, a few days to a couple of weeks, because I mean, there are 450 of them, right? So depending on your level of familiarity with hacking web applications, um, you know, you can browse through them, or, you know, they start from very beginning all the way to fairly advanced as well. So feel free to take advantage of that. And we're going to go and get started there. Other thing that I have is a GitHub repository that I actually started for my own benefit. So if you go to this hacker.org website with the number four, it's not a malicious site, right? It's basically, you know, um, a, a repository or basically, you know, this site that you see here. Um, the Exploit you will get something from this repository. I started, you know, this repository for my own benefit, and then I started using it in my book and my video courses, etc. And it has grown fairly, you know, significantly. There's at least at least 8,000 references in there. And I add pretty much, you know, something new every day, either tools, code or sample code or some type of references to, you know, new techniques and methodologies for, for all these, um, you know, for, for all these topics in cybersecurity. All right. So that's for your reference. One of the things whenever it comes to web application pen testing, and I know that we have a mix of folks here today, you may be getting started. And some of you may be actually doing this for quite some time. So if you're already doing this for quite some time, you know, feel free to uh, ignore this. Beginner to intermediate, I strongly suggest for you to become familiar with an organization called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. And they have, you know, different projects. One of the projects is actually a, a comprehensive guide on how to do an evaluation of a web application. So basically, you know, how to, you know, test a web application, or in other words, pen testing or find bugs and so on. That is by far the most comprehensive testing guide probably in the industry. Um, so I'm going to go and explain here what is cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, XML extended entities, you know, I'm not going to do that. But I strongly recommend that if you do not know, you know, what those things are, absolutely take advantage of uh, of these resources the other thing is that um, you know they have this page you know so if you actually click on the link in the bottom of the screen and you know again we're going to make all these slides available and they're already available in hacker.org so it's hacker.org slash vet second right so you can get those uh, right now and um, and they also have a github repository for most of their projects and in that GitHub repository, if you already are somebody in the industry that has a lot of knowledge about specific vulnerabilities and, you know, techniques or new methodologies or tools, I also strongly suggest to become active, right, and contribute to it, right? So um, now whenever it comes to modern web applications, right, the ones that reside on premise in an organization or the ones that are now being, you know, of course, orchestrated and hosted in the cloud or multiple cloud, you have to have a balanced approach. Uh, you have heard that, you know, of course, uh, some people say that pen testing is obsolete because in the cloud, if you actually look at, you know, time, we have this concept of DevOps, right? And we all know that, of course, you know, if you start in day zero and you do a pen test for, let's say, two weeks in here, by the time that you find that 100 vulnerabilities that you may find and put a report for your customer, 
they probably already instantiated new containers, new patches, or they either patch the applications or they introduce new new vulnerabilities. Or, sorry, they patch the vulnerabilities or they introduce new ones. So that's why a lot of people say, hey, we actually have to move security to the left. That's a big buzzword nowadays. And that's where you see DevSecOps, right? So instead of uh, DevOps, now you actually have this other you know, concept called DevSecOps. So at the end of the day, it is a balanced approach. Yes, you still have to do the, the normal things, right? Yes, you can do pen testing and yes, it can be effective in, in, in most cases, right? But a lot of the things that you actually look that can be potentially automated, that's where you want to actually do it as close to the development process. So in other words, whenever you hit commit into your code, that things are already magically you know, happening to find vulnerabilities and avoid for you to introduce those, right? Or inherit vulnerabilities from open source packages that you may be using, other libraries that you may be using, Docker containers in the Docker you know, registry, public registry, and so on. Source code review, threat modeling, all that applies. That's what we call a secure development lifecycle. And if you look at you know, some of the new documentation from OWASP, they actually do a really good job on defining that SDLC process, that secure development lifecycle process, right? And they go from the non-technical stuff like policy reviews, standard reviews, all the way to the development, deployment, and maintenance. I have this only for your reference in, in this uh, slide. It's for you to at least, you know, you know look at, I guess, uh, you know, application security as a holistic approach, not so much of, you know, just pinpointing, looking for a cross-site scripting vulnerability or a SQL injection and so on. So having said that, applications, specifically web applications are everywhere, right? I mean, we're using right now Zoom and behind the scenes, you know, there are APIs, there are, you know, many different things that actually this cloud service because it's a, of course it's a, a cloud ser, software as a service. Um, they're actually using tons and tons of you know APIs. And believe me, you know the guys that actually came uh, that I created Zoom used to work with me and Cisco. So um, so at the end of the day, you know they are everywhere. Now this actually has evolved throughout the time. If you think about it, the traditional you know web application architecture still somewhat like this, right? So you have a presentation layer. So in other words, you know, some type of web server, some front end, what we call the front end uh, application. And then you have, you know, some back end applications. So I just put back in here. And then you have one or more databases, you know, if you have a database, but in most cases actually you have more than, uh, more than one in some scenarios. Now, what it has changed is of course, I already mentioned the developing process, right? So from waterfall all the way to DevOps, but also the infrastructure from where we host the application, right? So now we're dealing with multiple clouds. Your email is in one cloud as a software, as a service. You're developing a, an application probably in AWS and another one in DigitalOcean, another one in GCP. So it's becoming very, very complicated into the fact of keeping track of what data, you know, where the data resides, you know, the applications and the frameworks, the way that you orchestrate the applications and so on. The other thing is that the architecture of the applications, of course, has changed from monolithic applications to now mic microservices, a lot of containers, and of course, a lot of people just say Docker, but Docker is not the only container, you know, technology out there, but it's the most prevalent, you know. So the way that we orchestrate this now also has changed, right? And that's where, as a security practitioner, and specifically if you want to concentrate in pen testing, and you want to concentrate on you know, bug hunting, you have to pay attention to these newer technologies, not so much of the three layer that we saw before, is actually what is actually happening in the back end that from an attacker perspective, I can take advantage of, right? So if I can compromise and put a backdoor in a base image in the image registry, then all your applications of course will inherit that backdoor or if I can compromise the API server or service in a Kubernetes, then I also can do some, you know, a big damage to a lot of the applications that you have 
orchestrating you know, in your environment. And in many cases, unfortunately, this is not being monitored, right? So sometimes you, know, you actually get application logs and you get you know, uh, you know, some type of accountings for, for authentication and so on. But whenever it comes to the infrastructure of orchestrating all these, in many cases, believe me, I work with very, very large corporations and government institutions. And whenever I do incident response with them, and some, you know, either image registry is compromised or, you know, some type of, you know, orchestration capability, whether it's Kubernetes or their Ansible or Terraform scripts, they run it, they have a, 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 a copy of, of course, the, their script, but something malicious actually happened and they were never be able to detect it. So you have to really pay attention to that. You also have to pay attention into the authentication flows, not so much of just a web, you know, a form authentication that was in the past, but how nowadays we actually not only do authentication for the main web application from a user perspective, but also for machine to machine communication. And in the case of Kubernetes, as I just mentioned before, things like OpenID Connect um, for single sign on SAML authentication for um, APIs, of course, you know, webhooks, the way that webhooks are actually being created. Also, the way that you do authentication for, you know, OAuth 2.0 or JWT tokens uh, and so on, right? So those are the things that you have to modernize yourself. And at the end of the day, it's extremely overwhelming, right? And for those of you that are actually just getting started, you may say, wow, I mean, I thought that you were going to give me some type of good news and some demonstration in here. Now you're depressing me. At the end of the day, yes, technology will actually pass faster than you can, you know, that you can walk. Basically, my analogy always is that technology is actually a jet, a fighter jet, and you're in a bicycle trying to catch up. It will always be the case, right? But what you have to do is understand how an application works behind the scenes, the purpose of the application, and in order for you to scale. And this is whether you're doing bug bounties on the side, you know, with something like HackerOne or Bug Crowd or Integrity, et cetera, or whether you're actually starting a career for pen testing. In order for you to scale, one of the best you know, practices is to break the application into manageable chunks because even automated scanning, which is not pen testing, can take hours in a larger you know, uh, application. And in many cases, what you do is you, you try to break out the application into functional, uh, you know, a functional breakout. So in other words, you, somebody you know, or you can take advantage of the admin a page, the other ones may you not know, take advantage of the reporting, you know, um, or at a later point, you know, look at APIs, the orchestration, and so on. And that's how nowadays groups of, you know, pen tester or red teamers, which by the way is not the same thing, right? Um, but um, they, they, you know, they divide and conquer in order to scale, right? And the other thing is, I already mentioned machine to machine authentication. So this is a little bit, you know, more uh, repetitive. Uh, what I want to do is actually, I want to go over most of the things that I have available for you as far as I actually hands on. So you can basically get started today, building your own web lab, web lab and practice with all these type of, you know, uh, implementations, right? Uh, whether it's machine to machine communication, whether it's, you know, some type of uh, cross site scripting in a web form for a user, or cross-site request forgery, XML ex extended entities, whatever the vulnerability is, just to think about how the application itself is constructed, what are the protocols behind the scenes or frameworks, because at the end of the day, how you become a better either pen tester or security researcher is not by using tools, is by looking at the methodology and truly understanding the technology behind the scenes, right? Now, um, this is what is actually kept keeping me up at night is basically the inheritance of vulnerabilities, right? And I think that you probably have seen this in many, many uh, uh, other presentations, but how nowadays we actually create code is that basically I put 15 lines of code, right? Plus somebody else's code or Docker images, right? So I can go to Docker Hub, get an image with Alpine, Nginx, some type of libraries, inherit this, they probably came with 10 vulnerabilities. Then my good old friend, Ron, he probably created this library 55, 
I inherited and I inherited two critical vulnerabilities and I may have a private registry with my, within my organization where I you know, pick Mongo, some libraries that we already have created and probably they have seven other vulnerabilities and other two vulnerabilities. So it's extremely hard to keep up. That's why, you know, either Docker and GitHub and, you know, many other uh, companies are trying to find ways to identify those vulnerabilities and even for free be able, you know, even in Docker uh, or uh, GitHub repository, be able to identify that and automatically even do pull requests and so on. Same thing with Docker. They're trying to actually pinpoint some open source known vulnerabilities, but that's the vulnerabilities that we know about the vulnerabilities that have a CVE or you know, identifier in the industry. But the ones that you're introducing, you know, that's like another, another big problem, right? So that's what I want for you to actually think about whenever, now I'm gonna share with you several resources on how you can get started to actually build that lab and practice your skills in a safe environment, but try to always think about beyond this, um, this environment. So the first thing that I want to show to you is this environment that I mentioned called Websploit. And yes, there's a Websploit, um, another tool called Websploit. I, this one I call it Websploit Lab, but you know, hey, the, the Websploit.org you know, domain was actually you know, available, so I, I picked it from there. Now, in the, the link that I made available to you. So hacker.org slash vet second, I have the link to the presentation, the lab guide. And again, that lab guide is for you to actually, you know, do it in your own time. And then also a link to Websploit, or you can actually just go to Websploit directly and it will take you to this page. It is nothing fancy. Basically what it is, is Kali Linux, I installed several other tools, including Ghidra for reverse engineering, uh, Jupyter Notebooks that you know I use for other courses, and you know uh, uh, Python, you know offensive Python, and, and so on. And you also have tons and tons and tons of you know other smaller scripts and and um, and sample code, because I cloned the GitHub repository that I mentioned to you in that environment. Then more importantly, what you have in there is a series of containers. And those containers are the ones that I'm highlighting here. It includes, you know, intentional vulnerable applications that have been created for quite some time. Like for example, WebGoat, let me get the notations again. Uh, WebGoat, Juice Shop, uh, Utility Day, BWAP, all those have been OWASP projects, right? DBWA, DVNA, and as a matter of fact, I'm actually adding a couple of more. Uh, that those stands for them vulnerable web application and them vulnerable node application, right? Tons of different resources and exercises you can do. Hackathon was actually created by Rapid7, but the last three that I have here, I created them for DEF CON. So if you think about it, the ones that I, you have right here uh, are intermediate. Or beginner to intermediate, right? Uh, Juice Shop actually has a couple of, you know, a little bit more advanced uh, capture the flag, you know, like uh, exercises, but for the most part, it's actually fairly, fairly, uh, you know, from the beginning to an intermediate phase. The ones that are below, like the Hack Me RTOV specifically and the RTOV safe mode, these two, uh, I consider them intermediate to advance, and this mayhem in the lab guide that you have, I believe, you know, I walked through through the exercises in there. So it's probably beginner to, to intermediate, right? So again, between all of them, at least you have 400 and different scenarios or exercises, if you will, that you can take advantage of, you know, in, in just one VM. And to basically deploy it, the only thing that you have to do is two things. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see it better. You install Kali Linux, and as a matter of fact, I used to provide OVA files for different things like VirtualBox and you know uh, VMware. But then you know folks have started asking, okay, do one for Hyper-V, and then of course you know Kali will release a new a new version. Then I have to update it again, and then people actually start asking me for KVM, 
And I, you know, I have an environment that I'm going to share with you in a second that is called Proxmox that uses KVM and QMEU. And, you know, it's, it's unbearable. And, and in this case, you know, I'm doing this, you know, freely. So for the, the easiest way to actually do this is that you pick your own virtualization technology, whether it's VirtualBox, VMware Workstation, Fusion, ESXi, you know, Proxmox, anything like that. So all, all, all that is up to you. And offensive security already created some OVA files, so you can you know, model that. And then after that, once you have it in a VM or in your main machine, if you run Kali, um, run this command, right, which is actually downloading an install script. And then basically, because you know, I'm installing a, a lot of things in there, including Docker, you need to actually use it with sudo, right? So, um, so with that said, basically, what that will create is a list of, you know, different, rep, you know, containers that you had in there. And I'm about to share my screen real quick. What you're seeing in the screen is Proxmox, right? Same thing can happen with VirtualBox. I have some other like Ansible uh, and Vagrant scripts that can actually orchestrate this either in VirtualBox or in Proxmox or also in the cloud. And I'm going to share with you a few other resources that we have for you know for you to do this in the cloud as well but what you see here Dionysius Hermes Prox uh, Nook Prox and Poseidon those are physical servers that I have in my house and within one of them you know so you see there's a ton of containers and and uh, uh, VMs but I have a couple of you know that are running web exploits so I'm gonna just double click on one and this of course is after I ran that command and in my case, I already installed Kali Linux, and I have a user just called Omar, right? If I do sudo real quick within the install, install script, and I have a few files in here that are, you know, that are not part, you know, I created it later, but there's one specific uh, shell script, it's very, very lame, but basically what it does it shows the containers that are supposed to be running, right? So a little table of all the containers. And as a matter of fact, the version that I have here, it doesn't have a couple of the containers that you will have if you run the script right now. Uh, and I'm going to show if for some reason, one of you already have Websploit, how to update it as well. But, um, but then the bottom is basically um, a little bit better formatted than a Docker PS command. So if you're familiar with Docker, of course, all the containers actually are running there. And by the way, all these containers are also in my um, uh, Docker Hub repository, right? So with my username and then of course all that. And I have a few others in there that you can take advantage of. And, um, and by the way, we're, uh, again, I lead the Red Team Village at DEF CON and we have a, you know, another uh, free, you know, conference at the, the end of the, the month, at the last you know, week of the month, and I'm creating a new container for that conference. And then I'm presenting also in another conference, you know, for some folks in India, and I'm creating a new container with more like capture the flag looking uh, scenario. So if you want to take advantage of that, you know, in a couple of weeks, just run the update that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, and you get those containers as well. So anyways, you know, once you're there, what what the containers are running is in the specific ports, and these are basically map, as you see down below. Depending on the application, like DVWA is running on port 80 locally in the in the container, and I map those to 8883, right? So if I go to my browser, very self-explanatory, and I go to localhost or 127.0.0.1, 8883, you get DBWA, right? So you can actually do uh, all the, the exercises, you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, locally. Now, one thing, since we're running the containers locally, that you will find in many cases that you cannot um, collect or intercept packets using a, a, a proxy like Burp Suite, and I'll show with you show this with you in, in, in a sec or show this in a second. But since we're running this locally, let me try to get my annotations back. Bear with me just one second. There we go. 
change the color. All right, so see what so we're doing this locally. If you do 127.001, and that's a 001, or localhost, in some cases, and it depends on the scenario, because uh, I mean, I have seen it all, but in some cases, Burp is not gonna, your browser is not gonna send the traffic to Burp. And I'm gonna share with you, you know, why that I'm mentioning Burp or the OAZ attack proxy or a proxy. And the reason for that is because whenever you're dealing with web applications, even with APIs, in many scenarios, you want to intercept the traffic between your machine so this is your attack box and the web application. It's gonna put WA for web application. And you put a proxy in between. And that proxy, you know, by default, in many cases is running on port 8080. And that proxy can be something like burp. There's also um, the OWASP Z attack proxy or ZAP. And there's several others in the industry, right? So what you do is in your browser, you want to actually send all the traffic to the proxy. And then of course, the, also the replies are being uh, collected. And I'll sh do a quick demo. And um, of course, in your guide, yeah, I'm providing a lot of, just because of timing here, right? I'm providing a lot of additional information that walks you through all the vulnerabilities, all the setup of the you know proxies and everything you know for you, but at least it's actually one, one of the number one things that if you get started with Websploit, people are gonna run into, run into. So if I go to my web browser right here, and I want to send traffic to Burp, first thing is you actually go to preferences and go all the way down to network settings. Go to settings. And in there, you click on manual proxy configuration. You can use this for just HTTP traffic and all the containers are only doing HTTP. We don't have you know, certificates or anything or a TLS enable. So you can safely just do that for only you know, HTTP. But if you want to actually you know, intercept traffic for other uh, you know, applications and so on, you can click on you know, use this proxy for all the protocols. Now, down below, this is where you specify that you don't want to do a proxy for a specific location. In my case, if you have something like 127.001 or localhost in here, remove that. And even if you have it there, I'm gonna share with you that in many cases, it will also not intercept the traffic. So I'm gonna click on okay. Now, if I go over to any site, you know, or any application here. So if I go to 127.001, still, you know, um, you know, still works. So I can actually log in as admin and for DBWA, the default password is password, right? Uh, and I'm logged into the application. But you see that it didn't, it didn't try to actually send the traffic to a web proxy. Even if I do localhost, you know, now I saying the proxy server is refusing connection. So in some cases, actually, you know, and I see them all the time, some cases localhost also doesn't, you know, send the traffic to a proxy. In this case, it is, which is actually a good thing. So if you get this error message, that means that you don't have the proxy running, right? So we haven't actually done anything with the proxy. So if you go go burp suite, and hopefully, you know, a lot of you are already familiar with this process. I'm just making sure that for folks that are getting started, that you um, that at least know the concept because at the end of the day, this is a lot of the heart of a, a lot of the you know exercises you're gonna be doing here with Websploit. Now, this is Burp, right? This is a community edition. Uh, there's a pro version, so you don't have to buy the pro version to do any of the exercises in here, right? You can do this one or the OSZ attack proxy. There are a few differences between the community edition and the professional. One of them is automated scanning. I have a couple of write-ups on how to use like Puff, which is a you know a web application discovery tool slash fuzzer, and um, um, Go Buster and so on, and then send that information to Burp. Uh, and I have some of the write-ups. So if you're interested in that, you know, follow up with me and I'm, make sure that that I 
that I included. As a matter of fact, I'm actually including a couple of them in the GitHub repository later today. But anyways, this is Burp, Community Edition. This is the proxy tab. And by default, you should see intercept is on. So if I go back to this page and I try to go to it, you see that it's actually now intercepting the transactions. You can forward that transaction. You can modify you know, any of the fields. You can also send these to different places like the decoder. Like for example, this one doesn't have that much in there, but let me, give me one second. Oh, and by the way, if, if you get, hopefully I'm able to reproduce it. There we go. Uh, yeah. So if you get this error message that you see unknown local host, right? Um, that's where the other message that I wanted to actually share with you before you go into the and do your homework, you know, after the, the, the presentation here, what I strongly recommend is for you to actually use the IP address of the Ethernet interface that is in your VM. That way you avoid, you know, the 12701 problem that you're not getting anything in the, in the proxy or this error message that you have in there. If you have an HTTPS a transaction, so if you go to, I don't know, hacker.org, you're also gonna get me one second and turn it off. You're going to get this error messaging here saying that Firefox is preventing you to actually connect to it. It is um, a detection that most browsers actually have that, you know, of course you will detect that you're going to an intermediate system that is not recognizing a certificate authority root certificate. And what you do is you can install the port swigger CA to bypass this problem. In the containers in Websploit, you do not have to worry about HTTPS, but in the real world, once you actually start doing, you know, of course, uh, either bug bounties or, you know, little pen testing, you know, out there, you have to pay attention to that. And basically you just have to install the Port Swigger Certificate Authority uh, certificate, right, into the process. And in the lab guide, I have some pointers on how to do that as well. So again, you know, just because of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my IP address. And basically here, uh, as you see, Ethernet zero has 10.6.6.104. And you know, if you actually put that in there, of course your IP address, now you're actually able to go there. Let me go to burp, intercept the traffic. And then you see, that I'm able to intercept the traffic, right? So if, you, if I want to actually send this PHP session ID to let's say the decoder, you know, you can actually do that. And I walk you through a whole bunch of different exercises and the options in here in the lab guide as well. And that's actually just scratching the first surface. I didn't actually include every single exercise, right? I mean, if not, it will be probably a 500 page document at least, but, um, but at least it gives you a flavor of many different vulnerabilities with different of these containers and then, of course, you can go on and further your learning at a later point. All right, so in summary, this is actually a Websploit, right? So basically Kali with the containers, a few troubleshooting tips, especially whenever you have a proxy configuration. The other thing is that when, when you're doing this, you know, on and off, and you're trying to turn on the proxy and turn it off and go to the settings and everything. There are extensions that assist that basically you can accelerate that, um, that configuration, you know, I guess the, the process, right? One of the ones that I, you know, that is pretty popular out there is called Foxy Proxy, right? And I have it installed and you can have different profiles. In this case, I have one for burp that if I turn it on or turn it off automatically, is actually changing the, the proxy server configurations in my browser. So you don't have to go to settings and do all the, you know, send it to port 8080, et cetera, et cetera. You actually basically just configure that and you configure it like this, right? I'm sending it to 12001 and, uh, and you, you know, edit the parameters if you want to change the port and, and so on. So that's a, a really nifty a one that is out there. Um, I don't like 
to then install, you know, things unnecessarily in your browsers specifically, right? I mean, I can probably modify that script to do that, but if, you know, it's a personal preference, right? Now, a few other things that actually are coming into this uh, repository or this um, environment is my GitHub repository. So if you go to hacker, just with the number four, under the root folder, you actually have the full GitHub repository. Within there, I have, you know, of course, cheat sheets, references to tools, sample code. Uh, for example, I teach a class that is Offensive Python and also Ruby Bash introduction and Linux introduction to cybersecurity professionals. I have a few examples in here that you can go to CD, you know, uh, change directory to Python, Ruby, and Bash. And in there, I have a few example code, like, you know, how to do a Python sniffer or... Um, a quick scanner that actually I created in Python, right? Uh, and in there, you know, of course, you have some type of sample code that you can also modify it and, and, and basically learn. So it's not so much of only, you know, a web application type environment, if not that I have a, a few of, you know, a few references for pretty much, you know, a little bit of everything related to cybersecurity, even game hacking in there. Uh, I have other things like, you know, cracking passwords, some exercises in there that you can actually go through it. Um, or at least the, 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 the examples under reverse engineering. You actually go there. Oops. And there you have these crack me files. Basically, you can think about, you know, a mini capture the flagish like you know exercises for reversing um, you know these binaries that are Linux binaries that you can actually do that with things like Ghidra, right? And by the way, that's also installed here for you um, you know with with the script. You know, install the script will actually install that for you. Now, if you want to update this repository because I'm adding information every day, you can do a few things. You can do a cron job. And then basically in the cron job, do a, a quick script that will do a git fetch, right? And then, you know, we'll fetch all the new uh, changes. And you see there's a few in there. And now you do a git pull. If I spell it correctly. And you see that there's actually, since, since I updated this one, there are a few different uh, files, 151 new tools. Uh, this new tools MD, or their markdown page is basically, let me actually go there so you can see it. Every day I have a script that goes through a whole bunch of different places on the internet and look for new tools related to cybersecurity, whether it's pen testing, reverse engineering, and so on, right? OSINT, so open source intelligence. Uh, and then I put them into the repository, into this new tools list, and then I go and validate them. And then I put them into the different categories, right? So. On a daily basis, even it's, it's not even no more, it's a, you know, I have a lot of automation actually going to update this repository. So feel free to take advantage of it, right? I mean, it's all in, in one uh, environment. And that's the beauty of it, right? So typically whenever you have a, a lab environment, you have an attacking box in on one side, you probably have another VM with a vulnerable application, right? They, and I'm gonna share with you a, a few places where you can download a whole bunch more. But um, but then it becomes you know pretty extensive, and what you saw in there with with um, Proxmox, let me pull it again. Of course, you can actually do Websploit, and um, as a matter of fact, I actually had Websploit Lite, which is basically a script that only uh, introduces the containers, or in other words, instantiate the containers on top of Ubuntu. And um, and I'm gonna update the the site with this script again, right? I'm gonna uh, include the new containers and so on, probably within the next two days or so, right? So if you want to keep up, you know, you can go to websplay.org and you're gonna get a few other updates. And by the way, talking about updates, um, if you go there and go all the way to the bottom, which is a little bit smaller. I even have a video that I walk you through how to update the containers, but it's so simple, which is running this wget command to actually get the script and then just run the script, right? So I created a script 
if I'm doing two things more than, or if I'm doing something more than twice, I'm definitely going to create a script for it. So, you know, a, a lot of my life is surrounding, you know, either Python or shell scripts, right? So you can download it just like, you know, you see here or using curl, and then basically you should just run it and it will update all the containers, all the new exercises and so on. So as I mentioned, you know, I typically, um, depending on the conference that I'm presenting or CTF that I create or, you know, different training that I do for O'Reilly and, and so on, I may actually be including, you know, every two months or so, a new, a new uh, capture the flagish, you know, container, you know, out there. So, all right. So bear with me just one second. I think, let me do this. Um, how do we handle the questions? I assume this through chat. Um, but, you know, I, I think that is the case. So let me, so Brian asked, can this works with Kubernetes uh, or so? So the containers themselves, yes. The, you know, the rest of, the things that actually install on top of Kali, you know, of course, you know, you know, you can probably instantiate the containers, of course, with Kubernetes as a, as the victim, you know, uh, containers, but you know, the whole uh, thing of Kali is, is a full VM, right? Um, now, big disclaimer, you know, this is not a best practice, right? But it can be done. I do a, a, a training for my company. I work for Cisco. And it's something, it's very corny. We call it becoming a hacker. And it's a week long boot camp. And what we do is we actually have OpenStack and I have Websploit along with several other VMs that are completely automate, also using things like Ansible and so on. And, um, and we're running VMs, yes, inside of containers. So technically speaking, can you do this? Yes. Is it a hassle and you know and a and a lot of loopholes and a, a hack? You know, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually it is, right? So and by the way, I saw your URA, so Semperfy. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to share with you is that don't get stuck only with Websploit. Within my GitHub repository, I have this build your own lab a markdown page and several other things that I have for you. One of them is actually how to build a pen testing lab, very simple with just Linux distributions and vulnerable applications, just like we're doing right now, or things in the cloud that are very extensive. Now, hopefully most of you know the different Linux, you know, distributions that are there for pen testing. They're there for convenience. I was using Kali, but Websploit can also run in Parrot. Why? Because at the end of the day, Kali and Parrot is Debian, right? So all the commands that I have in the scripts, you know, to install the different tools and the different containers and install Docker, all that, you know, will definitely run in Ubuntu, will run in Debian, will run in Parrot, will run in Kali Linux, and so on. It will not run in Black Arch, right? Because that's actually based on um, an Arch Linux. And there's another environment called Docker for Pentest that if you go here, as a matter of fact, um, this gentleman, um, he is presenting at the DEFCON Red Team Village in a couple of days, and I was actually just talking to him yesterday about his presentation. He's, he does a, a pretty good presentation about this offensive Docker, which is not the vulnerable containers that I'm talking about here. These are actually how to instantiate your own tools, right? So instead of running, um, instead of running a Kali as a VM, right? You install, you know, offensive Docker, and then from there you can install, I don't know, Nikto and and uh, I don't know, Fof and and Go Buster, you know, any tools like that, because at the end of the day you can run it anywhere. I also have a small Docker container that I that I use for myself for some basic reconnaissance for web applications and so on. But this one by far, you know, kudos to him, is a lot more comprehensive. And he also has a few things that you can uh, take advantage of to instantiate this also within uh, a cloud environment like DigitalOcean or AWS and also using Kubernetes, right? And um, 
The other thing that I have in this uh, markdown page is a link to this vulnerable servers and applications. So if you go there, basically this is another markdown page that I have a very, very comprehensive list of other vulnerable applications that have existed for quite some time, like, you know, Metasploitable and, and, and several other ones. Also, different learning platforms like VonHub. And if you're not familiar with VonHub, you know, definitely become familiar with it. This is the community, you know, people like you and me, you know, can create a VM for a capture the flag or to study for certification like OSCP and, and, and so on. And then you upload it to, to this environment. Now the guys from offensive security, so the guys that actually are, you know, behind the OSCP and Kali Linux, they're now maintain this and they also have, um, I guess a subscription service, right? A lot of companies actually do now for, for other, you know, specialized VMs and, you know, walkthroughs and, and so on. So this is the, the free, you know, uh, view of, of it, but there's also, you know, I guess a disclaimer that there, there's a way that you have to pay for some of the, the newer uh, offerings from offensive security there. Hack the box. It's a very popular track. Hack me is another one. E learned security, of course, uh, is a, a private company and Pentester Lab. All these, uh, especially Hack the Box and Try Hack Me, they actually have several scenarios and boxes that you can play for free, right? So if you click on individual, and hopefully a lot of you already know this, right? But they have act, you know different machines that you can get access to and practice your skills, right? Basically, different challenges. But, you know, they charge 10 pounds a month for having walkthroughs of some retired machines, right? And they also get access to some other machines that they, you know, they, they have in their environment. And then, of course, technical support, blah, 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 right? And Try Hack Me is basically their competitor, another really, really good, you know, platform. This is about uh, training and this is uh, another environment as well. So there are tons and tons and tons of different platforms that are now being created for you not to having to worry about creating your own personal lab in your home, but taking advantage, you know, of these basically cloud services, right? Uh, for, for practicing your skills, right? In, in the case of like Track Hack Me or Woolhub, I mean, most of these, even your attacking box, you know, can be in the cloud, right? So typically in some of these, you know, historically you just connect through VPN, like open VPN, but nowadays they have environments that you, you know, you don't have to do anything. You, everything is in, actually in the cloud. Now you already know about Websploit and uh, there's, the list goes on and on, right? Uh, there's a lot. Now, a couple of you actually ask, uh, or I, I at least mentioned Kubernetes. This is actually something that I'm a big fan. It's a, a colleague that also presented in the Red Team Village. As a matter of fact, you can see it here in DEF CON. He created this environment called Kubernetes Goat. And it's basically a vulnerable by design Kubernetes environment that you can instantiate in your site, right? So you can install it in your own environment. And he actually goes through the whole installation and, and everything in this presentation. It's, it's all, you know, in, 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 a, in YouTube. And of course it goes through here. But the other cool thing that he did, which is really, really cool. Let me actually just sign in with, I guess the GitHub real quick is that they have, go back again. Right here. So if you're not familiar with Katakoda, basically it's an environment that, um, or I guess a startup company, you know, so on that O'Reilly bought that, um, that basically has different scenarios and you don't have to deploy anything in your environment, right? It all runs in the cloud. And if you see here, actually, you know, the, the whole time, the estimated time to complete all the exercises is about two hours. But the cool thing about this, whenever you click on start scenario, now you have basically a full Kubernetes environment, you know, for free, you know, in, in, in the Karakota environment, right? So you can literally just click on launch, you know, SH to do the, the shell script to wait, you know, or to um, launch Kubernetes and it will do everything for you. Like literally just started Kubernetes, right? So you can actually go into their, oh, you have to wait for that. But 
at the end of the day, that has a guide and it walks you through all the different vulnerable applications. So if you click on the menu here, you see that it has scenarios around sensitive key code bases, Kubernetes namespaces, bypass, and um, you know container uh, um, you know co compromises. You know, it includes the CIS Docker container benchmark, right? So if you're familiar with uh, CIS, uh, they actually have different benchmarks for tons and tons of different things. You know, um, Docker in this case, of course, you have Kubernetes as well. They have other ones for frameworks of web, web applications like you know Django and and uh, React and you know the list goes on and on, right? So this is really, really, really cool. Not only you can actually use it to practice in your environment, but take advantage from it in the cloud, right? And you know again, you know completely free. And I have a few other references in that GitHub repository that hopefully you know are very, very useful for you, right? Looking at the time, I only have four minutes left. Um, and I want to give a, a few minutes for, for questions. But let me go back to my slides. And in your slides, of course, there's, there's a screenshot of how to set up, you know, WebSploit, the commands to actually do this, the vulnerable containers. Of course, we, we already went over, over that. I like to actually do this, you know, outside of slides. So slides for me are boring. Hopefully this was a little bit more interactive and more uh, useful for you guys. Um, as far as the attack demos, just looking at the time, you only have three minutes left, but in the lab guide, let me actually go into the lab guide right now. So if you go to hacker.org slash vetsecon, there's a lab guide in there and it's 60 page long, right? So of course we're not gonna go into every single thing in here, but it actually walks you through step by step into authentication and session management vulnerabilities and different you know, ways to, to abuse that, right? Bypass authorization, discovery you know, of different things, cross-site scripting, um, cross, uh, XML extended entity, SQL injection, weak cryptography implementations, path traversal, that list goes on and on, right? Now at the end, this is more of a walkthrough of a CTF. Uh, Mayhem was an event that I did for you know we did in the red team village in may kind of to practice for defcon since we went virtual and i created this intentional vulnerable application with a whole bunch of different exercises that one i don't tell you a lot of the all the flags but i walk you through most of them in here right uh, and uh, you have screenshots i mean you don't need me for this because um it's basically you know a self guided you know a tour of of the actual application now exercise 12 this is the one that i did for just for defcon safe mode and for this one i was actually giving a hundred dollars to whoever actually does the first write-up with all the vulnerabilities and and nobody has done right so if you complete this one and you do a write-up whether it's in github and medium you know in whatever that I can actually, you know, get access to, and you outline all the vulnerabilities that you find, the first one that, that will do that, I will give a $100 gift card, Amazon gift card, right? And there's another one there that I did last year that I was given $200, and uh, that's another different story. You know, somebody actually compromised it and was serving malware, malware to a, a lot of people. But, uh, but yeah, you know, those are there for your learning, have fun. I'll wait for one second here because I think that a couple of you got a couple of questions. Yes, so Raspbian. Um, there was another question in here about Raspbian. I have, let me see where I have that. So I created, this is mostly for O'Reilly, a 10-week program. So if you have an O'Reilly account, basically it's Safari, right? Most of the employers, and I think that in the military, you also get access to it. It's pretty cool because you get access to all the, the books, all the video courses, a whole bunch of light training and everything. But in there, I, I contributed a 10 week program from zero to, we call it, you know, to ethical hacker, but it's kind of corny. But it's a 10 week program that actually walks you through that. The last video in there, I'm gonna actually get it and I'm gonna publish it in GitHub and I'll post it in my GitHub repository too, uh, but I'll, I'll post it in YouTube. 
and I walk you through how to get some of these containers in Raspbian. The challenge with Raspbian is, of course, a Raspberry Pi is uh, based in ARM, and Docker has to be modified, you know, not modified, but, you know, you have to actually run it not, you know, by running the script that you have in here, right? Uh, and you also have to modify some of the containers and specifically node applications like Jushop uh, and so on. For Jushop, I have an ARM-based um, image that is in the Docker Hub out there. And I actually work with the, the creator of Jushop in OWASP. And I, I, I created a permutation of it, right, that, I, that will run in ARM. Uh, but not all of them will actually run by default, right? So I, I may, if I have time, you know, I'll, I'll probably, you know, convert some of the other ones, especially the ones that I created to run in, in a, actually all the ones that I created will run in, in a Raspberry Pi, you know, as long as you actually have Docker enabled. All right, so the last question is, do walkthroughs or other aids assist for the vulnerable web applications you created yourself? Yes, the ones that I have, so the one that I mentioned about the hundred dollars, I don't have the walkthrough. If I don't get it, probably then. Uh, oh, okay, perfect. I, I already answered the question. All right. So I am one minute over. Thank you so much for your time. Let me re-enable my video. Thank you again. You know, thank you for the organizers. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I actually recognized a couple of names before, uh, from the list. Please keep in touch and uh, have a good day. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much, Omar. That was super interesting. I know a lot of us are looking forward to going and playing with that.